Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the channel. We have lots and lots to cover today. So I'm going to head going to go ahead and get started a little bit early. Usually we try to wait a little bit longer, but today we're going to go ahead and get started. Now we're going to cover some headlines first, and then we're going to get into the cicadas. Understand that some of this cyber information that's coming up is setting everything up for a cyber summer and expect that the grid will be reset, shut down in places. And I think this is what they're prepping us for as we're starting to hear these stories intensify of these cyber attacks. So be prepared. Okay. Now the thing that sucks is it summers get hot, right? And if your air conditioning goes out, it isn't going to be pretty. I expect to see some of this being foreshadowed in the new film that talks about us, basically everything going into anarchy and chaos on the 4th of July is when that film releases the purge. So we'll keep our eyes peeled on that. But as now we've all begun to emerge out of our quarantines and restrictions, something else is emerging from out of the ground. And those are the cicadas. Now, these are one of the most mysterious insects known to man. The pilgrims actually called them locusts and believed that they were biblical. Now, before we break down the cicadas, I need to make an important correction from yesterday's show in which we debunked reincarnation using the scriptures. And then we'll get into a few headlines and then we'll get into the cicadas. Now, many of you had politely corrected me, and I appreciate when you politely correct me, because I'm not perfect, I make mistakes, about John the Baptist, that he was the spirit of Elijah, not Jesus. And so that was a major mistake, so thank you guys for, you know, correcting me on that. But the logic still stands, that these are rare Holy Spirit inspirations, not widespread, par for the course, every man reincarnates kind of stuff, right? Because if it was, it would be mentioned throughout the Bible. We have one obscure verse that is actually open to interpretation in terms of it being reincarnation. But we don't have any widespread of this happening. So, many of you also cited this verse in Hebrews 9.27. This also debunks reincarnation because it says, and it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this is the judgment. So that's pretty clear in my eyes. So thank you for that. Now, there are there will always be a segment of believers that believe in, in Christ that still try to hold out hope for reincarnation. Okay. And I don't know why you would want to do that. Who wants to go through this life? many times wouldn't you rather do what the bible says go to sleep and wake up with jesus i mean unless you think you can't get it right the first time around to be saved um i just can't imagine that that's the case so i wanted to very clearly correct those things and also give you guys some more information now let's get into some of these headlines and this is the battle over sticker passports. It's still raging on as some states are banning the stickers, the sticker passports, while other states are considering making them mandatory. I expect this to intensify over the summer as people want to travel. And once they have have us all where they want us, they will start dropping these mandates over the summer. It's going to be, I feel like it's going to be another mandate summer. Right. So instead of the mask mandates, it'll be mandates on passports in certain places that everybody wants to travel to are going to start implementing this. But meanwhile, the big white elephant in the room, so to speak, that is far more important than any kind of travel pass that would be mandated is the mandatory work stickers. As far as I know, no governors are really standing up to employers to, that, that are making it illegal for an employer to require a sticker to work. 
So who cares about travel when you don't have a job to even go on a vacation, right? To me, this mandatory employer sticker phenomenon is much more important than anything else right now on the table. So the governors need to get with it. That includes the Florida governor. Even in Florida, and these are one of the first states to make the passports illegal. Did a good thing there, but they're still allowing employers to require stickers. They're not now in Florida. You're not allowed to ask for proof, but here's the headline here. Florida employers can require CV-19 VC, but can't ask for proof. So as you can see, this stuff is arbitrary across the board. And this is where we need to double down and refocus. Now, what else is going on with these VC passports? Well, they're trying to normalize this into this is now going to be our way of life. And then eventually, it's just a matter of time. CV, VC passports in the U.S. Here's where here's what we are getting and why. This was June 14th. The European Union is about to launch a digital pass system. We'll get let residents prove they have been VC'd against the CV-19, recovered from it, or recently tested negative for it allowing them to travel freely amongst the 27 member nations. Then they're talking about the Israelis using a similar pass system. Australia has rolled out a digital proof VC certificate. Japan. So all these countries are wrap, ramping up. They're saying don't expect the U.S. to go that way. Now, I didn't know this, but Bo Jivin says that he won't enforce a federal passport. But here's what's happening. They're leaving it up to the private sector. They're literally passing the buck. And now they're giving free reign to private sector to enforce this. Now, what is the incentive of the private sector? Well, there's all kinds of backroom deals being cut. Where they're incentivizing the private sector to make you get the VC. They're getting tax breaks. They're getting all these things that incentivize them when, they, when you get time off of work for this, they get a kickback on their taxes, okay? So, the, in effect, the federal government is endorsing it and also incentivizing these private companies financially to push you to get it. So, what do you think these companies are going to do? To stay competitive, they got to do what the other companies are doing, right? This is the... The, the very evil part about economies and how they work and money being in control, influencing people to do things that they normally wouldn't do. It says with the Fed government unwilling to take the politically charged step of creating or endorsing a universal digital health pass, several companies are trying to fill the void. That might mean Americans will need several digital passes. Like so many credit cards in a wallet, it could also mean employers, businesses, and venue operators will each have to decide which works for them. So it's going to be a hodgepodge of hurdles this summer to do anything for that matter. You might even see supermarkets, particular supermarket chains popping up saying, okay, we are going to require these passports. Since the CV-19 rollouts began... Government trade groups and tech companies have offered ways of supplementing the paper VC cards issued by the clinics. Paper cards approved by this, they do not include a unique marker. So they're saying that this they're being forged. Some digital passes are already in use or being used, but none is, is expected to be universally accepted across the country like a social security card or passport. Why? Bo Jivin has made it clear he won't create or endorse a digital pass, but he doesn't need to. Always remember that. Don't give Jivin a pass just because he's not endorsing a pass because he doesn't need to. They've already set in place things to help employers incentivize them to force this on their people. So here's what's going on with that. Now, another article, VC Passports are now a thing as people gear up for travel again, June 14th. So they're putting this in the minds of America that you're probably going to need this with more and more people across the country getting VC'd. 
life as we knew it before is slowly returning to normal. No, it's not. One of the biggest trends expected to take place right now is travel. The number of destinations and countries opening up to tourists again. A number of these countries are requiring proof in order to enter. Leading to what some have dubbed a VC passport. Somewhere to carry around your ID. So, this is where everything's headed. And I expect this to intensify as time goes on. All right. Now we're going to have a little fun after I check in. Make sure you guys are with me. We are going to play a game. We're going to play Cact Fecker Gotcha. And I'm saying that funny because we have to. And why are we going to play this? Well, I'm just tired of getting pushed around by these people. As probably you are. Because a year ago, anybody who claimed that they had a CV-19 in December of 2019, they were shamed, roasted, deplatformed, and put on Facebook timeout. Remember that? But now, this article is saying that there were people most likely in the middle of December of 2019 in the U.S. who had CV-19. I'm going to pull this up so you guys can see this. Middle of December, okay? You saw it with your own eyes. Now, this article is dated June 15, 2021. More evidence suggests CV-19 was in the U.S. by Christmas 2019. But remember, here's what they were saying in the beginning. Shame, shame, shame. This is from March 16, 2020. No evidence Americans were had the CV-19 in the fall or December for that matter. It says the first reported case of the Wu-Tang Clan lab was on December 31st. So there's no way that anybody ever anywhere in America could have had it in December. Unlikely the number that there are any cases in December, given what we know about the course of it and its later symptoms. So, which is it? W were the first cases in mid-December in America, as this article says, by AP? Or was the very first case in Wu-Tang Clan? You can't have both. Where did it start? Okay, now... This is very clear backtracking. All right. Now they are going to say, oh, we didn't have the information. And now all of a sudden we can say that this is that. That it actually occurred in December of 2019 here in America. You guys, a lot of people were saying that they had a really bad flu -ru in the fall and winter of 2019. A lot of people, they said they were weak. They were tired. But they were shamed and thrown off the internet. Some of the stories were vi went viral on Facebook. They were removed. Here's another article. This was from last year. See, hindsight is always 2020. Falsely claimed. False, 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 false. It's false. There's no way that it started in November or December. See this? People were saying they were sick around Thanksgiving and Christmas. Now, some of these articles, just to give fair balance, say there's no information to support that. But when people try to come out and provide the information that supports that, they get thrown off the internet. Cancel cultured. Right? Now, if there's some kind of error in these old posts and they're outdated, why are they still up and why are they still confusing people? Or are our opinions and observations just as valid as the authorities and therefore we should not be punished or banned 
for giving our observations or opinions on social media when it comes to things like this? Maybe that's the problem here. Maybe that's what needs to happen. We should be allowed to talk about these things without being thrown off as dis or misinfo, right? That's what I think anyways. So I'll put these links in the pinned comment for the YouTube folks who want to come on and, you know, there's the proof, you guys. Right here, no evidence. And maybe there was no evidence back then, but why is this post still up? Is my question. The cact feckers, we have to call them. So, let's get into these cruise ships. Because we got a phenomenon going on as these cruise ships are looking... Uh oh what happened to my cruise ship article? Oh, it's gone now. Let's refresh this. These cruise ships are basically in some trouble. They're playing, trying to play hardball with American ports. American ports in states that have made VC passports illegal. So, of course, the cruise ship industry is tanking right now. Now, I've been on a cruise. I've been on one cruise in my life. My mom paid for it. This was before CV-19. She begged me to go. She's like, you got to go on this cruise with me. I said, Mom, I'm not really a fan. She's like, well, you know, come on, let's do it. So I went on a cruise with my mom. And it was pretty fun, I guess. But I remember 25 years ago, you guys will all remember these ads you would see on TV. They were almost giving cruises away. For a few hundred dollars, you could go on a cruise. But then... What happened on the time that I went, my mom paid a lot of money for this cruise. I think in the several thousands of dollars. And then this was after all of the cruise scares. Remember that? Started happening with these outbreaks and stuff. And I was shocked that cruises even cost that much after all of the propaganda of everything going on with the scares and the outbreaks on some of these ships. And uh, when I was on the cruise with my mom, she shared with me how much cruises had changed since the early days. Like, for instance, at dinner, uh, she said that it used to be where you had all you could eat seafood. And like, basically, food was just unlimited. Like, nobody was looking or counting. And then they did away with the seafood table. That didn't, that wasn't there anymore. She said there were like crab legs piled up to the ceiling and stuff. And that just doesn't happen anymore. Now, they probably blame that on some kind of outbreak, of course. She also says that now there are more hidden costs, a lot more hidden costs that there didn't used to be. That they had basically broken it, this out, all the costs, instead of just paying one set cost and everything covered. Um, she also said there are a lot less singles on cruises. Now, I'll tell you a funny story. I don't know if I've told you guys this story before back here in the chat while I tell this story. Back then when I went on this cruise with my mom, I was single. So she's like, son, we're going to find you a girlfriend. And I said, uh, okay, mom. So we went, on, we went on this cruise. It was a 10-day cruise. It was a long cruise. And at the end, so we look in the, every day they would give you this like little agenda for the cruise. They'd stick it in your door, your cabin door. You could pull it up and see all the activities on the ship, right? So my mom would run to the door and pull it, pull this thing off of there and go, okay, let's look for any singles events. She just kept looking and every day we'd look and there was, there was no singles events. Now you guys know I'm not a night person. So I was like, oh, well, mom, do we really have to stay up till nine o'clock at night to, you know, really? And then, I mean, how much game do you have when uh, you're cruising around with your mom, right? Anyway, so I didn't really have high hopes. And I didn't go on the cruise to meet somebody. But I thought, you know what? Maybe maybe I'll go on the cruise and meet somebody. So my mom starts talking to, like, every floor section of the ship has a person that comes down and basically takes care of you. Any of your needs, you can ask this the shipmate. And they're like real polite. They'll do anything for you. If you need Q-tips, they'll go get you some Q-tip, whatever you need, right? So my mom, every day she's going down to this thing. And I, by this time, I'm starting to get like internet withdrawals, right? Because 
then when we went, I don't know how long ago, this is probably like eight or seven or eight years ago, maybe. They didn't really have strong internet and you could get internet, but it was really slow and you had to pay a lot of money for it. I think since then, cruises have started adding internet or high speed satellite internet packages to try to draw more people in. But back then, basically you were on a, you had no internet. And so no wonder why people didn't want to go on these cruise ships. But anyway, time went on and uh, every night my mom would look this thing up and then the, the guy, she would ask the shipmate, hey, you know, was there any single stuff going on? He goes, yeah, there's going to be some later on. She goes, they used to have single stuff every night. She asked the guy, well, what happened? Why aren't there any single things? And, she, and he, he goes, ma'am, singles don't go on 10 day cruises anymore. Too much time out of work. They don't have internet. They can't work. They can't check their phones. She, and he goes, the, the singles all go on like the shorter cruises, like two day cruises or one day cruises. She's like, oh man. She's like, really? And he's like, yeah, sorry. So finally, my mom pulls up the singles night. There was one singles night for the entire cruise. And of course, it was for the people that swing all different kinds of ways, the LGBT community. There was no straight singles night. For the cruise, my mom was so angry. She said, she goes, what is this? You don't have a regular singles night? He's like, no, ma'am, we don't. So this is the state of affairs. And this was like 10 years ago, seven or 10 years ago. So you can imagine what things are like now. So I wanted to tell you that story just to give you a snapshot into what's going on in the cruise ship industry. And you would think that they would start to loosen up some of these restrictions, right? You would think that they would be better and try to cooperate with some of these ports when it comes to CV-19 and the sticker and the whole passport thing. I mean, in this case, I think all the fear and inconvenience that have been pumped into people over the decades about cruise ships is what's driving this it almost seems as though the people that go on cruises most of them want people to be vc they feel like they have some kind of protection okay i think people a lot of people are really afraid of cv19 because the media keeps pushing this fear now here's here would be my answer to this why don't the cruise ships just offer separate cruises to people who don't want the sticker that would solve everything okay you put them on a smaller ship if you want if you can't get enough people, but they might be shocked, especially people in Florida. They could probably fill up a whole ship with people that don't want the sticker, but they're not thinking that way yet. But anyway, let's do this last story. Then we'll get into the cicadas. Okay. And Amazon is running out of workers. And oh, the irony, right? And this is on the cusp of our own government coming up with this new bill to create a new federal holiday marking the end of slavery. And yet here we are with this article talking about Amazon worker burnout. And here's my opinion on all this. I believe slavery never ended. They just repackaged it. Here's what happened. Slave owners realize it was way too hard to be beating, whipping, and hurting their slaves. And they realized it was way too hard to keep taking on the financial resp responsibility of room and board, trying to prevent them from escaping, health care, etc., etc., etc. So, what do they do? They simply tricked them into thinking that they were free by giving them a wage. What does a wage do? It guarantees that they'll come back to work. You don't have to chase them down. And then what happens? You transfer all the other risks, liabilities, responsibilities back onto the slave. You don't have to worry about health care anymore. You don't have to worry about... Uh, you know, security. You don't have to worry about utilities and some place to put them. 
Now, Amazon has been working these people till their backs give out. And then they hire lawyers to try and deny them disability. And it's been long understood that American companies like to dangle this full-time employment thing, keeping most of their workforce out of range to receive health care and other benefits, right? It's modern-day slavery. Everybody knows it, but no one does anything about it. There are no laws in place that guarantee you full-time work. And then they tell you, oh, you just got to work harder. You just got to be better. But at the end of the day, they don't. Companies are disincentivized from providing full-time work. It's easier to hire a bunch of part-time people that you don't have to provide health care for and that miss out on a lot of the benefits, don't have paid vacation, paid time off. It's easier to do that than to hire full-time people. It just is, and they all know it. But no one's talking about it. And this creates a slave class of workers. Part-time workers that have to work two and three jobs, assume all the responsibility of caring for themselves, pay rent, utilities, their own child care, their own health care. We have a slave class of workers, and many of them work at Amazon. Amazon burns through workers so quickly that executives are worried that they'll run out of people to employ, according to a new report. Unbelievable. Employee churn is so high that some Amazon executives are reportedly worried about running out of people. They've been the company has been on a hiring spree to keep up with increased shopping during the pandemic. They've been hiring hundreds of of thousands of workers for roles in its warehouses, which it calls fulfillment centers. But these employees have been quitting almost as fast as they can be hired. Uh, maybe they're not being paid a high enough wage. Wow. So this is what's going on in America. That's supposedly quote unquote, the freest nation in the world. Well, I can tell you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel lucky to be working at Amazon. Now, here's where things have gotten with the workforce in America. This is why a lot of people just simply didn't go back to work after the spamdemic. And now they'll blame it on, oh, they were afraid that they would get CV-19. I don't buy that. Because we live in a, in a country now where it's acceptable for workers to mistreat their employees there's no recourse and employees will stay just so they can keep their job or so they can have the promise of full-time employment, which sometimes they never reach. This is exploitation at its worst, hiding in plain sight. Now, many of you will say, oh, Casey, how can you compare that to slavery? These people aren't being beaten or ray ped or teetered, but Here's what happened. The slave owners realized it was a lot easier to enslave people the easy way with a soft stick than a hard stick. Right? I mean, who wants to be running around chasing after slaves and, you know, and, and, and beating them down? So they justified it. They came up with a new type of slavery. Anyways. Welcome to Backwards World. And now for the cicadas. I know you guys have been really looking forward to this. Let's get into this. Brood X. Now I'm going to open this show with the verse from Revelation. The bottomless pit. A smoke arose out of that pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke... Locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. The inference here is that these locusts did not have the power to sting before they were given the power to sting locusts. Cicadas, they do not sting now. They came out of the pit. These things come out of the ground. 
do you have the seal of God? Now, I don't know if these locusts are the same as the cicadas. They probably are not. But God has an amazing way of showing little clues of things, nested truths of things that are to come. He reflects them in nature. And maybe that's what these cicadas are. Now, the Puritans of the 1600s were the first in America to see the cicadas. They called them locusts, and they believed that their emergence was biblical, probably looking at Revelation. Now, let's learn a little bit about cicadas. There are 3,000 cicada species on Earth, but only seven of those species are what are called periodical cicadas which are unusual in that they come out every 13 to 17 years. So imagine 3,000 species of cicadas. I know many of you have said, hey, my state has cicadas. This is not on the map. This map only shows some of these species of cicadas of the seven species of cicadas that are periodical, which only come out 13 or 17 years. And they're almost all found in North America. Now that makes the United States special. And I'm wondering if that is special in a not so good way. But there are even more interesting things about these cicadas of North America. This year's hatch is called Brood X, which is what you see on your screen here. And there are some things that make Brood X different than all the others. For one, Brood X is the largest hatch of all the cicadas in the United States. So that makes it different. So we're narrowing this down. We went from 3,000 total cicada species. Then we went to... Um, these seven species that occur every 13 to 17 years. And now we're down to Brood X, which is the largest of those seven species. See how we're narrowing this down here? And we're going to narrow it down even further. But as it says here, one of 15 broods of periodic cicadas that appear regularly throughout the eastern United States. This one says 15 broods. Somewhere else I read said that there were actually only seven but it says here is the greatest range and concentration of any 17-year cicadas. The brood's first major emergence after 2021 is predicted to occur during 2038, 17 years from now. Now, this brood X, what else makes it special is that it is centered around the capital of Babylon, Washington, D.C. Another thing about this is that this brood X is, seems to have a beginning. When we look at the history of this, remember the pilgrims saw an emergence of cicadas in like the 1600s. But this brood seems to have a beginning. Brood X appeared in 1715. As you can see here. It says, in 1737, botanist John Bartram wrote a letter that described the period periodicity, periodicity, can you say that word, of the brood's emergences and his 1732 observations of the insects' insertion of their eggs into the small branches of trees northwest of Philadelphia. Bartram later recorded in greater detail within two manuscripts the brood's May 1749 appearance. This guy, a Swedish naturalist visiting Pennsylvania, observed in late May an emergence of Brood X when reporting the event in a paper that a Swedish academic journal published in 1756. He said these things about it. He described documents that had recorded in Pennsylvania the emergence from the ground of large numbers of cicadas during May 1715 and 1732, he noted that the people who had prepared these documents had made 
no such reports in other years. So this marks 1715 marks the beginning of Brood X. Now, why is this important? Well, because including this year, 1715, and including the current year we're in of this brood and its hatch in 2021, I counted 19 hatches. And 19 is a special number. Those 19 hatches from 1715 to 2021 span 306 years. Now, the next hatch, again, will be in 2038. And I believe this is... This will mark the end of the Purple Rain Rainbow Timeline, our oral history timeline. Now, let's get into this number 17, because there is something very special about this number. We touched on this yesterday, yesterday's show, but I want to dig even deeper into this number 17. So I think there are some clues here. I'm going to pull out our handy dandy writing tool here, right on the screen, so we can document this. This is very important, put in red. Now, let's look at the number 17 and see if we could find some clues. Let's move this out of the way. Now, Number 17 is the seventh prime number. Now, remember, building seven was in the middle between the two twins. So we're going to put in building seven. We're going to put in twin one. We're going to put in twin two. Now, why are we talking about this? Well, Jesus, I believe was the five-pointed man. So we'll put Jesus here. He's in building seven. And he's five-pointed. Because why? Because he's got a head, two hands, and two feet. Whoops. Now, when you add God, and because Jesus formed the Godhead, right? Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit. So... We can add two more. Add God and Spirit. Now we know that Jesus was God, but this is the Godhead, right? The three are mentioned separately. Jesus prayed to God. So even though he was God, it was part of the Godhead. Now, this gives us seven. So, this is where I believe this seven came from. Jesus plus God and the Spirit. So, Jesus is seven. Now, in the five, there were twelve disciples. So, five, the five-pointed man plus the twelve disciples equals seventeen, right? So we've got 17 here. I know this is a hodgepodge here. 17. But then if you add the God and the Spirit, you get 19. Now these are two very special numbers because 17 is a prime number. And the prime number following 17 is the number 19. So we have two primes in a row. Now what is special about the seventh prime? Well, the seventh prime, which is 17... When you add up the first four primes, I'm sorry, first, what is it? Six primes. You get, let me say this right. I don't want to mess this up. Okay. 17 is the only prime number, which is the sum of the first four consecutive primes. So you got the numbers 2, 3, 5, and 7. Those are the first four consecutive primes. When you add those up, you get the number 17. Now, any other four consecutive, any other four consecutive primes that you add together, 
they always produce an even number that are divisible by two and they're not primes. So there's something special about the number 17. It's an elemental number, right? Now there's more about this as we go through the number 17 in this Wikipedia article. There are supposedly 17 elemental particles in the standard model of physics. I don't know if I believe this standard model of physics, but this is what they're saying. And they could be trying to recreate God by showing 17 particles, but here they are. Quarks, leptons, of course, the photons, electrons, I think protons are in here, but there are breakdowns of these other uh, particles that they seem to have found. This is all CERN stuff, right? So I don't, that's why I don't know if I believe it. But these are supposed to be the 17 elementary particles. Again, remember, the number 17 seems to be a number of elements, elemental numbers. Now, here's where things get more interesting. Because there is language that fits into the number 17 as well. See if we can pop into that. Why oh, this isn't working? Oh, that's why. Let's go in here. What's up with languages? Well, there are three languages that translate the number 17 when they translate the word, right? So, for instance, the number one is uno in Spanish, dos is two. Well, in these three languages, the format for the name of the number doesn't start to change into a compound word until the number 17. So in other words, every other word leading up to 17 in French, Italian, and Catalan is a single word. And then once you hit the number 17, it turns into a compound word, compound number. So that's kind of interesting. There's something unique about it. So, there's one other thing in here that I thought was of interest about the number 17. They talk about Google. Now this Google number, let's look it up on the page here. The sequence of residues of a Google or Googleplex, which is a very, very large number for N equals one, two, three, agree up until the N equals 17. So this is just mathematics. But as you can see, there's something very weird about the number 17. So I pulled up these things so we can try to break down what is going on with these cicadas. Here's the number of years of Brood X. We're in the 19th cycle now. The 2038 will be the 20th cycle. Here, are they, here they are here. Now these things are very, very loud. And they're saying that there's trillions of these things. Trillions. Not billions. Trillions. It's a lot. Here's a National Geographic article talking about 1634 when they witnessed million, millions and millions of these winged red-eyed insects sprung up from the earth. They liken them to the pestilential swarms from the Old Testament, called them locusts. Biggest of the 15 known periodical cicada broods is Brood X, which is going off right now. Here's some pictures. The red eyes are disturbing, I think. Now again, these things don't sting yet. But what if these are the, the bottomless pit? And what if they are given the ability to sting only those without the mark? Makes you wonder, right? And this is why you don't want to let your dogs, how do we close this, eat these dogs and cats. This uh, I was looking for clues to see if there was any uh, phenomena that happened for Brood X 17 years ago. There weren't that I could find. But uh, here's an article dated 2004 from 17 years ago. And it said that they have been known to make cats and dogs sick. From over snacking on them. 
don't know if one would hurt you. Someone else had mentioned fungus. Some of these uh, cicadas had some kind of fungus on them. You shouldn't eat them. I hadn't seen that. But anyway, that's what I wanted to show you guys today. That's the show. Now, later in the week, we have some crazy shows coming up. We, I pulled up, I wanted to look at African countries and I found out that there were like four or five African countries that haven't even gotten a single sticker. It's interesting because the, the, I guess you call it the program that they've put together to sticker Africa is called COVAX, which reminds me a lot of the Utopia series. That was the name of the company that made the stickers. So amazingly, those five countries that didn't get the sticker are not having a problem with CV-19. So is it really the stickers that's helping to eradicate CV-19 or is it something else? So we're going to look at those four countries. We're going to look at statistics on that. Also, I'm working on, oh, is, do I have it pulled up here? I don't have it open yet. I'm working on Manifest, the series that was kicked off of, I think, NBC and then picked up by... Netflix and it has now become like the number one or two Netflix show. So we're going to break down Manifest. Now Manifest is full of outright biblical references. It almost comes across as a Christian friendly series. But I know there's always going to be a zinger in the end. They don't just let us slide by you know, with that kind of stuff. With mainstream content like that. So we'll take a look at it, but already I noticed that the date that these people go missing on this airline is April 7th, which is 7-4 in reverse, right? 4-7 is 7-4, which is the 4th of July. Now this series came out in like, I think 2018, somewhere around there. So we're going to take a look at that. I'm in like the third or fourth episode. I think it went three seasons. We're going to see what we can find in Manifest. Manifest is about this uh, flight that goes missing for five years. It goes missing in 2013. It doesn't come back till 2018. And all the people that they love, some of them have, have died. And some of them have moved on. And so the people that come back have to deal with all this change. But something else happens. They've been... They've been gifted with some kind of ability to kind of like foresee things before they happen or to know things outside of their own physical experience that helped them to solve crimes and prevent other people from getting hurt and things like that. So we'll stick with Manifest and see where that goes. But I've already got some clips pulled up on it. So we'll do some kind of show on it. And uh, now let's go into the chat. Appreciate everybody showing up this morning. I love how our morning... Group shows have grown so much. I really appreciate it. I appreciate all of you. 74 means guardian, angel, and Jesus. Thanks, lines and lines. The second coming happens at the last trumpet, which is in the which is the seventh. Thanks, Hardy R. Appreciate that. Do not partake in any of these holidays. I agree with that. So did you guys understand that whole uh, lesson that we did on how Jesus fits into the number 17? Now, it's interesting because the word cicada has the letter Q in it. Remember, there's always a good and a bad side to all this stuff. But if you look at the word cicada, you could replace the C with a Q and it would sound like the same way, right? So... Q, obviously, alphanumerically is the number 17. But I, I like the Jesus version of it. I think Jesus is the true version of it. Where you have the five-pointed man with the 12 disciples. Five and 12 is 17. And you add the uh, God and the Holy Spirit. And you get 19. And remember, everything is 19-year cycles. The sun has 19-year cycles, eclipse cycles. It's called the metonic cycle. And we also have... The moon, that these uh, moon phases repeat exactly every 19 years. We have 19 total feast days. There aren't 19 feast days, but there's 19 totals because some of the feast days repeat. 
So there's something about this number 19. And I think we may have figured it out. The 12 plus the five-pointed man and God and the Spirit. It's like the basically the complete head, which also includes man's, the, you know, the 12 disciples. So, hopefully today's study was helpful. I appreciate all of you guys coming out. Yeah, I know the cicadas are not in the locust grasshopper family, but a lot of people, especially in the South, refer to them as locusts, as well as the um, the original pilgrims. All right. All right, you guys, I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the show now. Appreciate you guys coming out. Have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you in the morning.